And look who we have here at the Italian table. It's Patricia Russo, Executive Director, Women's Campaign School at Yale. Mouthful. Exactly. It's all about... And you got it right. Yes. It's all about empowering women. Correct. You're Italian-American. You're in a... Your folks had a mixed marriage. Mixed you marriage. You had a Sicilian. Father was mother Sicilian. was from... Naples. Naples. How'd that work out for you? Well, it was an interesting childhood. Uh, I remember my mother telling the story of when she met my father on a blind date, and she came home and said, this is the man of my dreams, I'm going to marry him. And the first question that my grandmother asked was, well, what part of Italy is he from? And she said, he's from Palermo, Sicily. Sicily? That's not Italian. Absolutely not. Not happening. It's no, not happening. All the time screaming. It, screaming. That's there and this yeah, is yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like, you know, Naples was the center of the universe, which is pretty hilarious if you know anything about Naples. So, um, so it was a very interesting um, upbringing because my mom was a pretty traditional stay-at-home mom. Uh, just basically ran the show. My father was very liberal which was pretty unusual for an Italian man. You know, he was just not the stereotype. And so they were interesting combination because I think I got the best of both of them um, in, in, in being very family oriented. I'm very family oriented and yet um, having a very big world view. I mean, my father was protesting against the Vietnam War. He was, you know, I remember watching the Watergate hearings uh, with him. And you grew up in New Jersey. Grew up in New Jersey, Jersey we, girl. We got a lot of ground to cover. Italian-American household. How important was food? It was everything, home? everything. My friends would come over for a snack. A snack would be a meal. In, in a normal household. G My mother would just start pulling out things from the refrigerator, mozzarella balls, brujute, salami, you know, a million things to drink, and then cookies, and, and this was at, you know, 3.30 when we got home. Because food is love. Food is love. Food is love. Did you continue that in your family? You have one daughter. Is, is, are, do you do the same I, thing? To or this are you too day, busy? we are a family of three, and she's launched, so she doesn't even live at home anymore. But I, I have never learned how to cook for three. I know how to cook for, you know, six and up. Um, <laughs> and as my mother would say, you know, it's like, you know, Mom, I really have to cut back on the, you know, the amount of food that I'm making because... It's just, I always have leftovers. And she said, so, it's the end of the world. If you have penny a la vodka, you know, as a leftover. <laughs> Not really. So, so you are all about empowering women. And I getting am. women into roles where they can lead and in politics. Where did that come from? It really came from watching my mom. I mean, she never talked about women's empowerment. She was just an empowered woman woman. She, as I said, she ran the show at home. Uh, my father worked in the city, so he really wasn't around a lot. And, you know, she ruled with that wooden spoon. Uh, we were one of four. And it's just the threat of the wooden spoon. Not that she ever used it, but just the threat that she might be going well, into the kitchen to get it. that was another word for respect. Yes. And don't stray too far. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it worked. So you started to empower women when? You go to college. How did you know that you were going to find yourself in the path you found Well, yourself. I don't know if you know my nun-nurse no story. I don't know if I share, have shared that with you. Give it to me. Okay. So my mother was one of those high holiday Catholics, you know, when, when it was Christmas, Easter, we all got new outfits. She'd parade us to church. And I remember loving the pageantry of the Catholic Church. I the mean, I'm just loving it. Yeah. You know, I just love the whole... Um, I, I loved going. I, and it's so funny because to this day I say, well, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but if I'm in a Catholic church, I know every prayer. I know every hymn. I know what's coming next. Uh, you know, I love the sign of peace. I, I just know it. You know, it's just a part of who I am, even though I am no longer a practicing Catholic. And so I know that I got that, you know, from base, her. Right, right. So one day, I announced to my mother at 10 or 11, you know, Mom, I think I want to become a nun. And kind of the seas parted, and I got all this amazing preferential treatment. My brother and sisters were basically my servants, which, you know, was fun. And have you met my daughter, Patricia? She's going to be a nun. Oh, no, I don't know. Do a that. badge of honor. Exactly. So then puberty hit, and it was kind of over pretty quickly. <laughs> And I remember thinking, how am I going to tell my mother, 
not so much my father because he was so apolitical. But how was I going to tell my mom that this was not going to work out? And I remember practicing in the mirror and just having this con constant conversation with myself about, you know, mom, I've thought about it and it's just not for me and this is why. And I was a wreck and I was such a wreck because even though, you know, she's five foot something, she's she was everything. And she was taken to this the bank that you exactly. were going to be a nun. Exactly. And I look fabulous in black. So <laughs> that, you know, that was back when they were wearing habits. That's how old I am. And so I was really, you know, when did that day come and, and how did it go? Well, I finally came when I just I just sat her down and I just said, in, you know, and it was bedlam because it was dinner time and she was trying to get everything on the table and my brother was there and my sisters and so I thought, this is it, you know. And she was asking me about the homework and suddenly I announced, you know, Mom, I don't think I want to be a nun. What? What? I said, I just don't think it's for me. You know, I have a crush on, you know, this, this kid around the corner and I and so so fortunately for me my father walked in at the time and she said I, I don't know what to say I don't know what to say to you and I was not the troublemaker you know I was kind of you know kind kid. of yeah I was a good kid I ruined it for my brother and my 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 two sisters so my father walks in and he's like what's going on and my father never spoke so for my father to even say one line was like wow everybody's in trouble and my mother looked at him and she goes, she doesn't want to be a nun. Now she doesn't want to be a nun. And my father said, that's perfectly fine, honey. You're going to be whoever you want to be. So that's why they were such a great, you know, they were great together because I thought I was going to get killed. <laughs> um, and that, that worked out. But then when I was, um, you know, I just started evolving. I got very active in the women's movement in Livingston. My father was working on the McGovern campaign. Mm -hmm. I actually, in my deluded little brain, thought he was going to win. I was having so much fun on the campaign. Um, and that's really, that was it. I had met Gloria Steinem and I, I, had, I was, had subscribed to Ms. Magazine. And so and that was basically way. it. I was launched. And then um, I went to George Washington University. I became head of the Women's Center. Um, again, great story. My mother is the quintessential networker. I mean, I got my skills. I talked to everybody. And so are you. I am the quintessential. Yes, man. you are. I love helping women get somewhere because men, it's an art form. You know, men do it for one another. Women, not so much. Proudest launching of a woman. <gasps> Who is that? Mm. What did you do? Mm. It can be just a story. Yeah, that's a good question. I have so many. <laughs> I have just... one where you thought, I'm going to get this gal into the spotlight. Okay. I'm going to help her make a difference okay. in this world. So that would be um, a very dear friend of mine who was making a gazillion dollars at the time. She was working for um, a hedge fund and she was miserable. And she had heard me speak and she said, I want to do what you do. I was head of the permanent commission on the status of women at the time. Mm -hmm. You're so inspiring. You're so funny. I want to, you know, I want that. I want to. And, you know, Rosie hears that all the time. You know, Rosie you, you, you look at Rosa yeah. on CNN and you're like, I want to be that. But they have no idea what it takes to be Rosa DeLauro. And mm -hmm. then when they figure it out, they're like, maybe not. 25 years in the U.S. House. Exactly. But when I told Stephanie what it was going to take, to make the shift from making a gazillion dollars to saving the world, I thought, this will scare her off or not. And she's like, yes, that's what I want. So I really helped mentor her. I opened some doors um, on her behalf. And um, she wound up being a, a vice president at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And she was launched. And I was so happy to do that. I mean, she was definitely worth the investment, right? And I was happy to do it. And I remember years later her coming back to me saying, I'm living the life of my dreams. I said, I know, so I am Patricia, too. Patricia, nice work. Thank you. When we talked about you coming at this table, if Italian women ruled the world, mm. you wrote a little speech. I Tell did. me about this. Well, I just thought about women that I adore, like Nancy DiNardo and Rosa and Nancy Pelosi. You know, it's a different kind of leadership when women are, are, are leaders, right? They, we are very collaborative in our style. I think we're able to check our egos at the door for the greater good. And even at the campaign school, I'm a prop speaker. I love that, the okay? brochure. Even at the women's campaign school at Yale, um, 
It's a bipartisan program. It's issue neutral, which is why I think we're celebrating our 21st class this Pat year. Pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I mean, really, you we built really it. very, really built it. Yes, we built it. Who goes here? What what type of person, age, wh who goes to this Women school? who are running for public office attend. Uh, women who are currently in public office who want to get to that next level, say they're in the state house and they're ready to run for Congress or governor or attorney general. And women who are interested in campaign management because that's another area where we see very few women running state campaigns, national campaigns. It's still very much a boys club in both of those arenas. Um, but we have found and the you know statistics show that when women run, they win. It's just getting more women in the pipeline. So that's what we're about. We're about critical mass, getting more and more women in the pipeline and just saying, you know, it's your time and we will help you. We will train you so well that you will be confident and you'll get out there and you'll run and you'll run a really great campaign and and nine times out of ten you'll you'll win. How are we doing? Terribly. As a country. Horribly. How it's, are we it's, doing? So, it's, so give it's a report depressing. card on that. Well, I like uh, to talk about the start of the school, which happened in, you know, 1992. 1992 is the year of the woman, you may recall, and I feel like I every 20... Busy, but, uh, you were but too thank young. You. 1992 is the year of the woman. Uh, every 20 years, I feel we cycle out and we get a year of the woman, like last year was a, another year of the woman. It's ridiculous. Um, and there were so many women running in 92. I remember going to Rose's house like every weekend because all these women from other parts of the country were coming in to the Gold Coast, that is Connecticut, to raise money. And many of those women ran and won, you know, won their congressional seats, their Senate seats, and then 1993 happened, and it was as if 92 was a dream, and it was as if it had never happened, and we were just like, what, what is this? What's this about? Why can't we, you know, we thought we were going to create this tremendous momentum. We were able to demonstrate that so many women on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, had been elected, so why? Why were we not, where did all the women go? So, you know, that's when Andre Brooks, who's um, actually a um, reporter from Westport, said, you know, I had a brilliant idea to start a campaign school for women. And back then, there really weren't any. And wanted it to be at Yale, and, um, you know, there we are. 21 years later, we have about 80 women who come every year. Most of them are women who are interested in running for public office, although we do have more and more women who are interested in campaign management, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I most especially, there are things, many things that I love about the school, but we truly are bipartisan. We truly are. Um, and which so, goes back to your folks, Naples and Sicily. Exactly. I never <laughs> put that together before. It took a Swede. Yeah, to, see, uh, a stoic Swede. A stoic right? Swede to figure that out for me. But exactly. And so there are Republican women who've never talked to a Democrat before un until they've come to our school. How is that and, possible? Well, it's, it's, you look at Congress. Are they talking? Not really. How is it that you're not in office? How is it? Yes. I love the behind scenes stuff. I love telling people what to do. I love, um, talking to women about what's wrong with their campaign and how they can make it better. I'm effective, I think, because I do the top 10 things that I do well, and I never have, never have to worry about somebody calling me and asking me to fix their pothole on their street, or I never have to work on issues I don't care about and have, I don't have any passion for. I'm a very passionate person. And so as a result of that, I have to have a, a commitment and really feel that I want to I want to make a difference and this is how I've decided this is the best way to do it. When I do a speaking engagement for this, the campaign school out of town, I'll email our um, our graduates in the area and I'll say I'm coming to town. I want to meet with you. I've got appointments every hour on the half hour. I just sit and talk. It's a beautiful thing. And I said, you know, I want to hear the good stories. I want to hear the success, but you know, I really want to hear when things are not going so well. Because that's when you really need a girlfriend. That's when you really need a network. That's when you really need a mentor to say, you're going to be OK. This happens to everybody. It's just the way in which women handle when things are not going well versus men is very different. The way in which women decide to run for office is very different from men. When, when women decide to run, again, 
for the generally they decide they want to change the world. They, you know, Maura Lyons is a perfect example, our first woman Speaker of the House right mm -hmm. here in uh, Connecticut. She was so apolitical. She was raising her children. And uh, she had made a, a comment at a cocktail party in Stanford one night about the sewage treatment plant in their neighborhood reeking. And was anybody going to do anything about it? And then she wrote a letter to the editor in the local paper and said, you know, those of you who are interested in talking about this, can you meet me at the diner on Saturday? And they closed down the diner because so many people showed up. And they, you know, shut down that sewage treatment plant is only more I could do. And then they turned to her and they said, you should run for office. You know, you should, you should run for state rep. And she said, you know, yeah, maybe I will. And then she became majority leader. And then she became our first speaker. How much are you like your mom? I'm very much like my mom. You know, I didn't think I was. You know, when you're raised a certain way, you assume that everybody else is being raised that way too. I really had no, nothing to compare it to because I just assumed everyone had parents like mine who were just incredibly supportive. And I was kind of the black sheep of the family because after the nun thing didn't work out, <laughs> then the nurse thing didn't work out. And then when I announced that, oh, I was going to, go to I, I got a great job again, Thanks to using my mother's incredible networking skills, um, I was a political science major at GW, and one of the prerequisites at that time was to work for a member of Congress. And of course, young feminists, the only one I wanted to work for was Bella Abzug. Everybody wanted Not to work for Bella. Not many remember her, and what I a know, force a she force. was. Rose is our Bella. That's yes, all I'm going to say. Rose is our Bella. Tell me, you know, you wrote in your speech about there was always leftover food in your house an extra chair. Tell mm -hmm. me about that story. Is that Italian or is that just your mom? Um, I think it's Italian because I don't, I've never been to an Italian household that just has, you know, four pork chops for four. Okay, so. Portions. Yes. There's no, yeah. There's no portion. It's just everything's family style. And um, so I just didn't, you know, my mother na never made, you know, 10 brownies she always made 30 because our house was kind of the flop house growing up not only did my friends hang out but my brothers and my sisters so it did tend to add up in the basement and she was always making something for us to eat because you know and she worried about the poor and she was she was very very and still to this day is just extraordinarily giving beyond her family and beyond herself and that's why you know i say that it's thanks to her that my family has become all the women that I that I work with. Oh, that you've I collected help. women all over the country. I know. Which is kind of neat. Yeah. Do you speak Italian and do you make sauce? I do not speak Italian, and I will tell you why. When you have four children and you have no privacy and you have 20 minutes every night to speak to your husband, you speak Italian. Even though he was Sicilian and she was from Naples, they spoke Italian uh -huh. so that we would not understand. And we would just sit there. And we were like, what are they and, talking and about? And none of the four of you none of us took, took it in. No, none of us. You know, I are, took, you, are you sad about that? I, I am sad about it. Because you've been to Italy. I have been to Italy. That's Italy. another great story. No, I, 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 exactly. And then, no, we do not make sauce. We make gravy. See, now someone said, if you're from Jersey, it's gravy. If you're from this part, it's sauce. So see, you, it, no. It's, it's gravy. It, so it's gravy. Italy's a great story. Why? Going to Italy. <sighs> Um, it was my dream to go. It was my dream to go to Palermo. You know, it was my dream to go to, to Sicily because my father had always wanted to go back and, and never did. And so Was he born there? He was born there. Okay. Yeah, he was born there. And so um, t uh, 10 years ago now, um, my daughter and my best friend who was living in Paris at the time, we did this road trip one summer and she lives in Paris so we started in Paris we went to the south of France and then the minute we hit the Italian border it's like the this these are my people <laughs> they're screaming yelling laughing feeding people do you want you know do you, do you want a biscotti and I'm like okay you know do I know you doesn't matter and I wasn't even speaking the language which is you know my daughter was like crawling under the car seat because you know no matter where I am I'm you know an embarrassment <laughs> and um and so I just felt so connected. I felt this is where I'm from. You know, these are, these are my people. And it was really hard for me 
to be in France because they're so quiet. A different animal. And then, you know, I lived in Tokyo for three years. Right. And so I remember. That's not Italy either. No, it is so not. And um, it was, it's really lost in translation. I don't know if you've seen the I've movie. been to Tokyo. So okay, I, so you know. I, I know. So when we went, um, my husband was running, he was a partner at Ernst & Young and he was running Asia and we were based in Tokyo. And so we get on the plane and it's 14 hour flight so he knows I'm held hostage, right? There's no, I'm not going anywhere. But you're busy networking on the plane. He says sure. to me, honey, you know, you're gonna have to tone it down. And I said, tone what down? He said, this. You gotta tone it down because you know they're, you know, they're very quiet people. They're very polite. I said, "What are you implying?" And uh, I thought it was. I thought his timing was brilliant. That you know now you're telling me we're, you know we're gonna be there and we're gonna be there for three years and now you're telling me that I can't be me. So I got there and I remember feeling very self-conscious, which doesn't happen to me ever. And I remember thinking that I could not be myself. I was kind of like the Japanese version of a Stepford for Dwight. I would just smile a lot, you know, yes, hello. And, you know, that, that was it. I had, you know, a lot of broken. You don't strike me as the demure type. I was demure, demure for about four days. It just didn't, I just <laughs> didn't take. It didn't take. So then I just had a talk with myself and I just said, I just have got to be me. It just doesn't matter where I am, I just have to be me because I believe, as my mother does, that people need to feel valued, important, and loved. So it just became my mission that I was just going to be that. Um, and then when I saw all these Americans behaving very poorly in Japan, I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be a different kind of American. I want to be loving and kind and I want them to be able to say nice things about Americans. So whenever we would walk into the Tokyo American Club, everyone at the front desk knew me, they knew my name. Again, we're not surprised. Shocking. Yeah. My husband, you know, you know, he had been there as often as I. No one knew who he was. Of course, they all knew Katie because Katie was all always with me. She was ten at the time. But I loved it. I loved that that I knew everybody, and that's how my mom is. You know, and still in our our town, she's we, she, what we've been in Livingston over fifty years. She knows everybody. Everybody loves her. I like knowing everybody. I think that's why I'm so happy here in Connecticut because I love walking into the room and saying, "Wow." I know three quarters of this room. It and just gonna, feels like home. I'm going to end it by saying, and you're with your people in New Haven because there's so many Italian Americans in New Haven. Patricia Russo, thank you so much for empowering women, making a difference in people's lives, and being Italian. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's you been betcha. a blast. Spend all night kissing and a bump is right here Then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution And find a piece of the door, but it's also a metaphor Things keep locked in the grocery store of my mind Just the same time, skip right ahead to the last ride The harder we look, the less we can see Don't you know, you know, you know that 